Good evening. Welcome to our first A-List Facebook Live. Thanks to all of you, our A-List is growing. We have a community of around 6,000 now, and it is growing, and many of you have helped to make that possible. The A-List uh, grew out of two problems that we were trying to solve. How to accelerate recruitment for clinical trials, and how we became partners in research. Uh, right now, because of the work of everyone you see here, we have a seat at the table, which is very important. But when we are brought forward, we are one voice with one story to tell, and we really felt that we needed to build a community where we could amplify the voice and show that there were differences within the community and make it rigorous because no one would pay attention to us otherwise. Uh, that the researchers, regulators, and healthcare providers really needed to hear from more of us who were on the Alzheimer's journey. And the A-List makes that possible. Uh, tonight, we're also announcing a partnership with AD PACE, and that stands for the Alzheimer's Disease Patient and Caregiver Engagement. It is the first of its kind in our space uh, that's a collaboration with a public-private partnership. Now, the AD PACE component will ensure that our patient and caregiver voice are heard by the regulators and that it's implemented into drug development, regulatory reviews, and very important to all of us, reimbursement determinations. We have a great panel assembled. Uh, you're part of the conversation, so please don't forget that uh, we can't do it without you. You can write your comments in the side and we'll be taking your questions and picking them up. Uh, and we'll answer them as best we can throughout the project. Uh, I'm going to ask our panel to introduce themselves. Uh, Jim and Jerry, you, you lead off. Uh, Hi, I'm Jim Taylor. I'm a care partner <clears throat> for my wife, Jerry. And Jerry and I have come down from Manhattan to join you this evening, Manhattan, New York. Give a little bit of your background, though, Jim. Well, I, uh, I was an IBMer in finance for 30 years in Westchester County, New York and uh, retired into Manhattan, and uh, we share homes in Connecticut and Manhattan now. Jerry? Um, I'm Jerry Taylor, Jim's wife, and um, my background is, is in uh, long-term care in New York City for 45 years, and um, I'm busy uh, applying a lot of what I learned in practice because I have Alzheimer's now and I'm here to, to talk about that journey. I do want to say, uh, Jerry, that uh, my apologies. Everything is couched in a regulatory pol policy, the patient and the caregiver. And we really like to talk about those living with the disease. So please excuse us if, in fact, we end up with the patient caregiver. We are trying to wean people away from that, <laughs> but it does take a while. Holly? Hi, I'm Holly Kresa. I work at Otsuka Pharmaceuticals. I head up our health outcomes research groups there, where we study health services research, how treatments impact diseases and patients. Martha? Hello, my name is Martha Villanueva Santiago. I should say that I'm an attorney by trade, and now, uh, as life would have it, a caregiver for my mother. Uh, being first generation Latina, um, quickly gotten uh, versed in how it is all about Alzheimer's and how to live with someone with Alzheimer's. Thank you. Ian? I'm Ian Kramer. I'm Executive Director of Leaders Engaged on Alzheimer's Disease. We're a coalition of about 100 organizations that are working primarily through public policy to try to advance the science so that people facing dementia today and hopefully not in the future have better prospects for quality of care, but also hopefully for the science to produce uh, ways to avoid the disease mm -hmm. or slow its progression. So we want to improve quality of life and we want to ultimately stop dementia. Jim and Jerry, uh, you've signed on to the A-List and been wonderful advocates, helped us even design surveys, really got in, in the middle of it. What opportunity does this open up for you as an advocate? Well, Merrill, there's a perception that an individual with Alzheimer's is someone whose world is shrinking, that uh, as they slowly lose their short-term memory and have cognitive impairment, that their world is, is becoming smaller. And the same, same may be say, said for their, for their care partner, the caregiver, that as they spend more time caring for their loved one. 
But Jerry and I, during this time, have very purposefully and intentionally decided to speak up, to make our voice heard, to share our experience, and to tell others about how the disease has impacted our lives. That there's a Chinese proverb that says, the bird does not sing because it has the answer. The bird sings because it has a song. No one individually has the answer to this disease, but we all have a song, Meryl. We all have our own experience and our own insights into Alzheimer's. And it can be a very empowering experience to share our song, if you will, to, to tell someone our, about our experience, about our, to share our insights, especially if that someone wants to hear what we have to say, that they can benefit from what we've experienced from, from our insights. And A-List provides that opportunity, gives us a chance for our voices to be heard. We're speaking to uh, service organizations, to pharmaceuticals, to individuals who want to know, who want to learn from what we have to tell them. And that's a, a wonderful opportunity for us. You know, individually, none of us can make a difference. But if we, if we speak together, there's a chance that we can make a difference, that we can help provide the services that are needed, and perhaps even make an impact in curing the disease. Well, both you and Jerry are very powerful together as advocates mm -hmm. and have really stepped forward in a marvelous way. It's sort of taking the pain and flipping it, and I think that really uh, adds to quality of life, uh, being heard. Um, Jerry, uh, we have great respect for the researchers. Uh, they're our rock stars. You are in the middle of clinical trials. You go in and out of clinics. Are they asking the questions that matter most to you? What happens when you walk out of that situation? Uh, well, you're right. Um, we very much appreciate the work being done by the staff and researchers at Yale, where I participate in a clinical trial, as you said. In general, the staff on all levels is very caring and supportive. They monitor my physical health and my cognitive test, uh, test abilities. The opportunity missed, in my view, is the observation of reporting a functional day-to-day -day management of life. So many daily activities subtly impact by the client, by, are impacted by declining brain function loss. Usually I find strategies to cope for my gradually declining uh, situation. However, I have not learned to compensate for my loss of sequencing ability, which directly impacts my organizational skills, handling of money, numbers, time, etc. These issues are not probed in my cognitive testing, and I have not reported them in my quarterly clinical reviews probably because of the subtle nature of the changes. Well-designed A-list survey gave me the opportunity to report this important type of change, which I believe is often missed in the clinical situation. You're very eloquent. Um, there are coping mechanisms that you use uh, to help. You were reading your conversation and your experience. Are, is that a trick that we could help other people use or those who are less comfortable? Um, I, I think so. Um, I, I, one of the problems that um, people with Alzheimer's run up against is that um, while our thoughts and our words uh, may not line up, we ha still have a multitude of ideas and that makes us a little dangerous if we have to <laughs> stay in the family. I love your company. <laughs> 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 so to stay to the point, I always need to script so that, um, because we have a purpose here, we have a topic, 
and I can have um, some very interesting thoughts, which I, I say, well, if I put them over in that bucket, I might not remember them. So I'll take an interlude and go off. So um, I think uh, a lot of people with Alzheimer's uh, might find it handy to have little notes. Uh, writing it out, it, for me, is the best way because even little notes are sometimes too short. What was that referencing? <laughs> you got to put it really, <laughs> really, really put it, really put it down. <laughs> well, <laughs> by the way, you're not alone. <laughs> I think we I'm all sure write I know that. <laughs> you know that, and it's comfortable. Okay. Holly, um, Patient-centered research is not new. I mean, every time a new pharmaceutical comes out, there is anticipation of the Alzheimer's journey. Mm -hmm. Tell us what's evolved and why it's different in the Alzheimer's space. Sure. Um, Patient-centered research has been around for decades. Um, we use that the type of feedback we get like this to design products, whether it's in pharmaceuticals or health services or uh, uh, Apple Watches. Um, that type of research has been going around for, for a very long time. What's changed over the last 10 years or so is really the voice of the, the patient, people living with different diseases and their caregivers has gotten a lot louder. And our government has reacted and implemented se several different laws that encourage different agencies or um, new agencies to be developed to focus on patients, such as the Patient-Centered Re Outcomes Research Institute, PCORI, uh, which was established in 2010. And that louder voice has altered how we researchers consider how we might use that information and how we might use that information for other stakeholders like the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. Um, the FDA in 2012 initiated a whole series of patient-focused drug development initiatives to hear from patients and their caregivers. Um, they, they realized that one voice who may be showing up just for a meeting is not necessarily representative of everybody. And what we've just heard here is unbelievably invaluable, and you echo that a thousand times for the different variations of what happens with, with people, and you can really make a difference. So scaling our voice becomes critical. Absolutely. That's very helpful. Martha, um, tell us uh, your story. Well, my story is that uh, unplanned and, of course, uh, out of left field, um, we go to um, the doctors with my mother. And this was back in 2013. And when we go to the doctors, uh, I had already been in touch with her, her doctor and she had told me that I see evidence of the Alzheimer's. So we were, my sister and I went and said, do not tell her until we're with her, because she was living alone at the time. And so we go in and unfortunately the doctor was so, I hesitate to use the word negligent because I'm a lawyer, but, um, <laughs> but she really did not do much uh, provide any guidance, or and I don't know how it was, Jerry, mm -hmm. when you're given that very difficult diagnosis to the family as well as to the patient, would, you know, uh, being first generation, my parents really rely on their Spanish. Is my language, my first language was Spanish, believe it or not. And I was, full, you know, because we were raised, I guess, the American way, so English began when we began school. But we go in and, and this doctor uh, speaks Spanish, but she just looked at my mother and she said, Carmen, you know what Alzheimer's is, right? And that was the end of it. Mm -hmm. Then I proceed to tell her, well, doctor, she's been complaining about the stomach, she's not eating. And then she does a very um, superficial exam and comes out that I saw white on her face because now she was diagnosing colorectal cancer. So you have two morbidities right. that you're dealing with, which Simultane complicates right. simultaneously. Simultaneous. And that is not, unfortunately, that is not unusual mm -hmm. for many families. And it really, the cost of care goes up sixfold when you are trying to manage an issue like a cancer and plus add that dementia overlay. It is right. overwhelming. Both Your experience, mm -hmm. by the way, 
we, we can do a survey for you on that. Um, <laughs> uh, in fact, we Sadly. probably, we probably yeah. all know yeah. that yeah. that is not atypical. No. Uh, being feeling very isolated with the diagnosis that comes up um, let me uh, here's a question this one is uh, for the tailors and I'll get back to you in uh, what do you did you think about when helping design the surveys and this is from Hudson from Virginia well the survey we designed Merrill and we worked with you uh, and a colleague of yours was the topic was um, why so many Alzheimer's patients fail to participate in clinical trials. And this gets to a question, and perhaps I'll jump ahead to that right now. Um, less than 10% of individuals with Alzheimer's disease participate in clinical trials. And we view that, we collectively, mm -hmm. as a crisis in the Alzheimer's uh, arena right now. Us Against Alzheimer's and the Alzheimer's Association have done a tremendous job in dramatically increasing government funding for research in Alzheimer's. And uh, they've quadrupled from 400 million to 1.8 billion in the last four or five years. But at the same time, the number of individuals participating in clinical trials has not increased. And therefore, we're not going to have the patients that we need to test these new drugs to see if they're going to be successful. And now 30% of drugs are not able to enroll their number of needed patients, and there's strong delays in all the new drugs coming forward now and being able to be tested. So we're delaying potentially curing drugs or modifying drugs now from each of the marketplaces. Holly, you keep shaking your head. I'm sure, I'm sure <laughs> you know. I mean, that, de that delay is critical. Not only are the costs, how costly it is, yeah. but it is really the delays in filling the trial. Mm -hmm. And to think that together we could help accelerate that yeah, was one of the driving goals. How do we keep people close to the research, all right, right. engaged so when there is a trial, we can raise our hands. And as you move into the prevention space, mm -hmm. They're looking for healthy adults our age to step up mm -hmm. and say, this is the future. And yeah. Jerry, you and I have talked. We do it for our grandchildren, mm -hmm. and it's very important. Yeah. Ian, you come with a public policy hat, hat on with LEAD. Tell us about LEAD and why you feel that this uh, trove of data that we're trying to put forward becomes valuable when you when you go to Congress or talk with regulators. Right, so what Congress understands that sometimes those of us that are immersed in the day-to-day -day fight against Alzheimer's sometimes lose sight of is it's not actually rocket science. The science is really tough, <laughs> yeah. but the public policy isn't. What lawmakers and regulators look for is basic human truth. But to uncover what that is, what would matter to people that are either living with Alzheimer's or another form of dementia, living with caregiving, or know that they bear some risk of living with these conditions in the future, for Congress to understand what Congress ought to try to deliver through appropriations, through spending taxpayer money on science, or what Congress ought to ask federal agencies to provide in the way of care and support programs or other other needs for our community, they need to hear from people that are living that experience. They don't need to hear from lobbyists. They don't need to hear from scientists. They need to hear from people that are going to use those services and use those medical products about how their lives will be changed and whether those ways mean anything to you. So, Jerry, what you said earlier about how you go about answering questions from Merrill or anyone else actually, I think, is part of the beauty of the A-list, because the A-list doesn't put you on the spot to come up with an instant answer to a question you weren't expecting. Now, I know you actually do quite well with that plenty of times, but it doesn't force you into that situation the way that a doctor or a researcher or a member of Congress or a reporter might. It gives you the opportunity, not only that you and Jim help sometimes design the survey questions, but even when it's someone else's survey questions, to sit, reflect, come back to it when you're ready, write your notes, and collect your thoughts, and answer them at your own pace, mm -hmm. not start to finish, but whatever works for you in your, in your own voice. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that's what the A-list does in a magnified way, and it returns to Congress something more than individual anecdotes. It returns a body of evidence that can be aggregated and understood through the anecdotes for its deeper meaning. So you, you take the aggregated data and you can say 4.7% of people living with dementia believe X and 92% believe Y. But you can also then dive deeper and say, Jerry told us something that gave meaning to those numbers and gave meaning to what we in Congress or we in a federal agency are doing to try to help Jerry live the best life possible. To me, that's the beauty of the A-list. And we're calling it, um, we all have stories to tell, but it, we're calling it data with soul. Right? <laughs> it, it is going right where we live. Yeah. You are all part of this conversation, so we really encourage you to ask questions in the comment uh, comment section. Martha, I want to get back because this is one of the biggest women's issues since breast cancer. We outlive men statistically. We're more prone to get it. In fact, we're six times more likely to get dementia ourselves as caregivers. I left my career when I was 48 years of age to take care of my husband with early onset. 22 years later, uh, I'll leave here to go do the night shift and take care of both my husband and my mother. But the idea of women, you dropped out of the workforce, as did I, because there were no options. When I look back, and that was 20 years ago, nothing has changed. No, sorry. And that really, that upset me for the next generation of, of women who are helping their parents. I mean, we all have different family situations. Uh, no, as an attorney, what does th what does that say to you? You know, as as an attorney, you'd think I I would be better prepared for this, and but no one is. Um, I think that that the way, unfortunately, as you said, it hasn't changed for women or anyone else because it's just hits you, and sadly, uh, almost embarrassing that you know. Yes, I'm an attorney, and I should have been more prepared to to face this. But as you, yes, your gesture is, is, is welcomed because it, we're human. And so it is a, a, on the personal side that uh, we should all be prepared because at the age of 53, mm -hmm. I was not prepared to retire. I can't retire. What, what, that's yeah, that's ridiculous. Retire. <laughs> yeah, that's ridiculous. Um, so nor can I resign. But I had to because, as you said, there is no choice. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, with no plan, uh, with only plans that I was going to retire from where I was working at the time, <laughs> and, you know, worried about what, what am I going to do indefinitely because we don't know much about Alzheimer's. And my mother only has my sister and myself. And so that's it, you know, to deal with the two um, <coughs> diagnoses. And so we had to then, I became her advocate, and at the same time I learned to be my own advocate and put my documents in order because, as you said, you know, the caregiver statistics aren't any better, you know, and, and I know many because I belong to a, a support group. And unfortunately I've seen and I've met some uh, caregivers and they've passed. And because of the weight and because of this constant struggle. You know, they're beginning to look at, at it as a form of post-traumatic stress because mm -hmm. it's the intensity of care yes. over time. It took me four or five years to unravel the financial mess my husband made on the way down as the executive function. Mm -hmm. And the issue, in fact, with the A-list, we're taking that issue of being prepared and actually doing a survey that's coming up for everyone to take a look at that asks those questions. Are you prepared? Do you know the difference between these documents that you need to have in place? It's really preventative, but there is a window because at a certain point, it's too late. Right, right, <laughs> and, and that's why I said, you know, uh, I'm embarrassed to say that even though I should have been more prepared because of what I know, my training, and I, you know, these are things that I tell other people. Um, you have to do it at that point. And unfortunately, yes, you know, when I answered some of those questions and I saw them and I said, no, the reality is I would not have started to do this plan but for mm -hmm. my mother's mm -hmm. diagnosis. Mm -hmm. 
So it's yes. interesting because there, there. I don't mean to make everything about policy, but there are real <laughs> policy implications yeah. to where the A list can power information to address some of these yeah. financial challenges sure. that yeah. do hit women much, much harder than they hit men in the aggregate. So there are at any given time various pieces of legislation floating around Capitol Hill that would offer long-term caregivers a tax credit, mm -hmm. others that would offer uh, a social security credit for time away, forced time away from mm -hmm. the conventional workplace for this other extremely important work that benefits us as a full society and acknowledging the loss to retirement planning that long-term caregiving imposes. And, and whether you agree or disagree with those particular policies, the A-list is an opportunity to ask better questions in more depth and get much more vibrant and nuanced answers than a Pew poll, where you're just saying, are you for or against this Senate bill or that House bill or the President's proposal? or you can get into this in a much more meaningful way that can change policy, not only based on what laws might get written and how they get written, mm -hmm. but also then how private sector employers may respond, whether laws are passed or not. Well, I, well, I don't think I can well, I add on, yeah, on that is that in Arlington, which that's my other hat, uh, sitting on the Commission on Aging in Arlington, and we are following, I'm, I'm in charge of the, the Legislative Committee, and one of the things we are aware of this, the credit and how it doesn't get passed, and we are aware of the long term and the family medical leave uh, plan and allowing for uh, family caregiving to be covered under FMLA. That's my employment discrimination hat, and but it, it hasn't moved. But right. taking those personal stories on the Hill, hopefully, will move them because a lot policy is a lot easier than if I have to fork over money. Mm -hmm. Well, in the area of policy, Holly, uh, the FDA is patient-centric, all right? So where does the caregiver, caregiver come in? Is that really CMS? What is the interest in, because we become the surrogate for patient-reported outcomes, unfortunately, at a certain point in time? Explain so, that. <laughs> yeah. Explain so that while, while the FDA obviously is looking at treatments, their mandate is to look at treatments for individuals affected with diseases. Um, they do listen to what is happening to others around those patients and caregivers or those um, that are interacting on a daily basis with somebody can really provide some um, insight into maybe what somebody is not telling you about and that allows us to explore in more detail and remind people, um, whether it's those affected with Alzheimer's and dementia or the caregiver themselves, about what might be most important. And that information can be used back to this conversation to design services um, that can help. And from a private or a public sector perspective, having the details of what happens to each individual really helps you tailor what is necessary and how many people that might affect. So you know whether it's really worthwhile to go after that group of voices or, or, or not and how much impact you'll have there. You know, it is in the detail of our lives and we never quantify as caregivers what we do. We do it, but it's that economic dollar sign and then you say, oh, and we're doing it unpaid right now as well. Right. There's. Hi, Alyssa, you're from Wisconsin. Uh, the question is, has there ever been something like the A-List before? The A-List is really, like all the private Facebook communities online right now, you're talking to each other. But we're trying now to impact policy together on things that matter to us. And it's in the detail of our lives that we're trying to talk. So that's the... That's somewhat of the difference, and we called it A-List. We could have called it the Alzheimer's Club, but you know, it was sort of clubby to be part of the A-List. Everyone sure. wants to be part of an A-List of a some B. kind or the other. Not the B -list. <laughs> Certainly not. We're not the B-List, no, right? <laughs> Jim, uh, you've been very deliberate in your focus, and it is on clinical trials. As ambassadors, uh, Tell us what it would be like to be an ambassador and how you're trying to organize to make that happen. Well, a couple of ways. Um, as we referenced earlier, we one of the things that is a challenge is increasing the number of people in trials. And as, as Martha mentioned, many people with Alzheimer's have what's called comorbidities. They have other diseases, um, cancer or other 
reasons that they cannot participate in trials. But many otherwise healthy individuals are, are available to participate in trials. But there's a lot of misinformation uh, that's out there, Merrill, that people hold on to and choose not to participate. And this is slowing the delivery, we believe, of a cure. And so part of the challenge is dealing with that misinformation. Part of the challenge in getting additional people into trials is understanding how trials can be better designed to encourage people to participate. So it was a perfect opportunity to use a list as we did with uh, your encouragement. And so Jerry and I had the uh, opportunity to work with you to, to really ask individuals in the A-list what it is that keeps you from more readily participating, how, what changes could be made. Um, also, some, of the, some of the answers were quite surprising. I mean, a very high percentage in that sur survey that we did ended up, uh, Jim, saying that if they were rejected, and we do have an 80% screen fail rate, mm -hmm. We were never told why we were rejected. Right. Well, the disease is rejecting enough, excuse me. Absolutely. Uh, that is something that researchers could fix yeah. easily. Right. And, you know. and then once you're rejected for one trial, doesn't mean you might not be able to get into another trial. That's right, but why right. But rejected you know, once, please. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't tell me, you know, then that affects your attitude and your inclination to join a That's second right. trial. So if you give me the feedback, if you keep me in the family, if you keep me in the dialogue, I'm much more likely to participate mm -hmm. a second time, so let's do that. Mm -hmm. So also, as we know, uh, Global Alzheimer's Platform, GAP, uh, uh, an organization of clinical trials, has now entered into an alliance, a, an agreement with Lyft because one of the big disadvantages is providing transportation for the person with the disease and their care partners, the patient and the caregiver, to get to the, the clinical trial sites. So this was an idea that for some number of years, for many clinical trials, you'll be able to have transportation from your home to the clinical site. So this was another opportunity to, once we found out how serious an impediment that was, to be able to meet the needs of, of the client, if you will, and get them to the site. Well, That's one great. of the other very good things about the A-list is that there's um, an opportunity to communicate back research results, because while people oh, are always absolutely. wondering <laughs> why why they weren't involved in, you know, why they didn't qualify in a trial, to be able to say thank you, first of all, for volunteering. Here's what happened, here's here's what we found, and here's why this matters. Is, is an invaluable part of this particular community that you've pulled together. Thank you for bringing that up because Very much important. of research does not give you back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They'll ask you for something, but they don't give anything back to you, and that is one of the promises we make. We do have a question from Emily from Pennsylvania. Thank you for joining us. How do you expect the A-list surveys to change as new advances are made in the fight against Alzheimer's? Uh, Emily, we are what we would call a perfect for the pajama advocate. Give us five minutes of your time late at night when you're alone and take the survey because they're rapid fire. They're, they're, you can complete them. Well, Martha, you just, yeah. you're new to the A-list. What was the Brand experience? No, that was so quick and, and I... Did you want more? Or? Yeah, because I said, okay, where, where is it? Where is it? You know, uh, and it wasn't late at night in my pajamas. And so, but it was so easy and then, you know, it did, I think, what you touched on, that establishing that trust brings people in and what better way than to have a network of caregivers, people that, you know, it's like they say preaching to the choir. And so I know I work with a lot of different community, diverse communities, and I've heard it from both, just not just Hispanics, but also uh, from African Americans that there's this trust issue of whether to participate or not. And I think having a community of other caregivers helps to establish that trust and say, you know, it's a welcoming environment and all the other factors that you've talked about, you know, you get results, they give you feedback and... How many other surveys do you ever get feedback from? I Correct. Mean, that's a unique oh, yeah. aspect. <laughs> you wonder why you have such terrific response rates. Well, it's because you give feedback. Sure. People find out what they what the results are. And they're responding quickly, which is very helpful because then the feedback, then there's a stream sure. of right. ongoing information. 
Uh, Lisa from Maryland uh, asks a question. I'd like to uh, throw it uh, to you, Holly. How does this data mm -hmm. get us closer to the cure? So we've been looking at a lot of different things in trials to try and measure um, meaningful change over time. This is going to give us different things to look at. Um, we've not found the magic bullets yet, um, and there probably is not one cure. There will be many different treatments. There are many different services that will help, whether they're digital technologies, um, medications, everything, and all of the information we'll be getting from these surveys and other parts of the AD PACE initiative and the A-list work um, will really help fill out the picture of different targets we may be able to look at that maybe we didn't realize were there. Just by hearing that this specific issue happens in everyone, that actually tells me there may be a different target. Mm -hmm. So with behaviors, for example, mm -hmm. which is uh, always many too often a trigger for institutionalization, mm -hmm. uh, those are the types of things. If you get enough scale in the responses mm -hmm. that you can tease out mm -hmm. Uh, these details, mm -hmm. they become valuable they as become data. They become very valuable, and maybe there's something more sensitive to change over time that makes it so maybe we need less people in trials and or less follow-up, and we can look at something that's more sensitive um, and, and will allow us to look at something else than we've been trying so far. Um, or it may just help round out the picture of what we have been testing to show why it's meaningful. Two, uh, two far to Pharma's credit, I, I think having been the, through the experience, as have you and Jim and Jerry, the thoughtfulness with which they bring us in and try to understand what's important to us or do we understand the questions, uh, I, have, I have really been touched by that because that's a very labor-intensive process. Yes, and many of us are asked questions we don't know what the future of our journey will look like, quite frankly. But by comparing notes together, mm -hmm. we are beginning to paint the picture mm -hmm. of that, exper that experience over time. Mm -hmm. And I think that is one of the, uh, the values. Martha? Uh, no, no, I was agreeing with you that, that it is bringing it all together because we're all, you know, I, I say to many people, I can't speak for the entire Latino population. Mm -hmm. However, if more from that same community join, mm -hmm. then we have a good solid um, data ba bank so that we can say, well, for this culture, it makes sense to make these types of mm -hmm. clinical trials. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Or sure. And you're quoting data, actually, or you're quoting numbers that back up what mm -hmm. your experience has been yeah. or shared experience. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I've been doing this work for 22 years at local, state, and federal policy making. You look levels. too young for and that. Yeah, <laughs> I started when I was 60, so I think, uh, I'm working backwards. Uh, if there has been a dominant theme throughout those 22 years of experience of working with policymakers, with advocates, with providers, the clinician community, long term care providers, researchers, and even sometimes self-advocates as caregivers and people living with the disease, I think there's the dominant theme has been whose voice counts when. And the only people that have ever gotten that right in 22 years mm -hmm. are people like Jim and Jerry. Mm -hmm. Everybody else, despite great intentions, up and down the line, nobody wishes harm on caregivers no one wishes harm on people living with this disease, but every one of the rest of us think we know better than you. And we think our good intentions should be superimposed on your lives. And it's this pernicious kind of institutionalized paternalism that the A-list can reveal and then reverse. So let me just give you two examples, and I'll try to be brief because I, I really want us to get back to the audience questions. One of the things we've had to fight against, and the A-list is really a prime example of doing it right, is not taking away your voice too soon and giving it to Jim. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Couldn't agree. Oh, yes. Yes. And, yes. And, Can we stop and, and talk about that for a moment? Well, or you yeah. If I could just give, line, give an anecdote. Go ahead. So a year, year and a half ago, I was asked to be on a panel at the FDA when they were talking about kind of a final review stage for massive, complicated 
piece of legislation nicknamed PDUFA, patient, mm -hmm. yeah, you know this one. So it's kind, of a, it's kind of a structure on how industry will contribute to FDA's work to try to advance and push forward the science faster. And I talked about, I didn't have any answers, but I just said there's this immensely complicated question that FDA and industry will really need to come to terms with and grapple with, which is how long can people like Jerry speak in their own voice? And God forbid we take away your authority to speak for yourself prematurely. And that's no disrespect to Jim, who has your best interests at heart too. But the worst thing we can do, I think, is say, we know what's best for you and you don't because you know better than the rest of us what's so right for you. Right. And one way that plays out is a lot, a lot of researchers think that the, the thing you're looking for, and tell me if this is wrong for you, it may be right for the next person, is they say, well, Jerry must want longevity. And what I keep hearing from people living with Alzheimer's is, I want better years, whether or not I have more years. And it so often happens at home, Ian. That's what we have to struggle with. Do you want to speak to that, Jerry? Um, I, well, I'm, I'm, in, I'm into what you're, <laughs> to what, you, what you alluded to is struggling in, in, in terms of how things should be handled. Um, you know, it's taken us a while to get to the principle that Jerry does what Jerry does uh, first. Then Jerry can ask for help. <laughs> um, or if it's clear to Jim, then I've like shuffled over the papers four or five or six times and I'm really getting stressed out of kindness, he'll come forward. But, um, and we've, we've, you know, some things are, are clear. I can't handle numbers, you know? So, uh, no more with the finances. You know, we did it early on before this slope went really down, so things are laid down. We, but, um, we strongly believe that too many care partners, caregivers, move in too quickly and then finalize the patient. But we also believe that too many patients don't strive to find strategies that allow themselves to be right. Right. so it's a it's a two-pronged fork right. if you will mm -hmm. we believe that more services should help patients find strategies to allow themselves to be independent for as long as possible but also we need to help caution care partners to hold back and as long as the care as the person with the disease the patient can remain independent I also want to pick up on on another and on something else you mentioned is that everyone else knows better than the, the patient. You know, we're giving compliments to the FDA, but it's a far different FDA than 20, 30 years ago when AIDS really revolutionized right. mm -hmm. the voice of the disease mm -hmm. and the FDA. And it, it was a wonderful change, very unfortunate for those individuals Patients. who suffered. But I, I believe that we with Alzheimer's and the community and the care partners have become too relaxed with that and we do not speak up. There are not enough Jim and Jerry's across the country, not to compliment ourselves, but we need more advocates like ourselves. And it took me a long time to realize that, that we're counting on us against Alzheimer's and the Alzheimer's Association to, to carry the banner. Right? They can't carry the banner if we don't speak up. But we also have realized that sometimes they do fall back in thinking they do know better than us if we don't tell them. And sometimes we have to insist that they listen to us and encourage them to include us. Yeah. And so we've got to be vocal. And the A-list is a perfect tool, but look at the results in your survey here. You know, the, this is the data on which you need to base going forward. So we hope that we can train additional people, uh, another opportunity that, that may lay in the future, to be better advocates and to speak up across the country. And if anybody's out there that really feels that they have an opportunity to speak up, and we highly encourage them to do so. And the disease is isolating, let's be honest, yeah. because when you're taking care of a loved one in a more advanced stage, uh, you are isolated with the patient. The ability to get out and advocate is 
a luxury. It's, this is a vehicle to, to be part of that voice if you can't get out as well. So right. I think we need, we need every, all of us, <laughs> that's why we called ourselves us against Alzheimer's, quite frankly, a number of years ago. Uh, here's a question from Christine from Washington, D.C. And Jerry, I'm going to give it to you. Um, what matters most to you? What one aspect of the disease would you cure first, if you could? Well, simplistically, my brain. But <laughs> <laughs> it work. But I, I, I know, I know this person is really looking for more refinement. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, language is impacted, and language is the bridge to so much. And, uh, you know, love of your family, uh, expression of yourself, um, even being able to um, view yourself mm -hmm. and your experience of uh, living. Um, so that. That is the aspect I, I, I so want to hold on to, and I keep pushing at uh, various uh, strategies and talking to people and looking and, you know, um, what more can we do with, for people therapeutically um, to maintain that, um, you know, that communication. And, and, and just simply, there are some strategies. Don't make long sentences. <laughs> you know, Thirty second you sound bites. Right. You'd be great. Use <laughs> what you got. You know, people understand. Uh, so I think that that would be that would be the top. The other thing, because you had the Alzheimer's in your family, you yes. were very aware of the experience itself. Yes. The issue of uh, not remembering your children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have a very interest, very different take on that mm -hmm. experience and what that would mean because you've lived it, you're living it both yeah. ways, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because of the likelihood of the, de 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 the uh, gene passing down from that end and having uh, just a number of family members with Alzheimer's, um, and I must say that um, we didn't go very far into the real depths of um, three, four people in the family uh, because um, the other things, the heart, the, the strokes. Um, prior, prior generations. Prior yeah, generations. The, the older generations didn't have the care. Um, I ran to Lipitor the day they uh, put it in the box. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the good news and the bad news. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to be, my generation, we're going to be healthier and with oh, yeah. Alzheimer's longer. Yeah. And not, not seeing those signs. Um, so I sort of went off the... Uh, there, <laughs> no, I listen, the everything oh, comes out of your <laughs> rapt attention. We have a question um, from Leda. Uh, talk about the rise of online resources that make it easy to find caregiving tools and clinical trials based on each family's unique situation. All right, how <laughs> it's all out there, we like to think. Oh, yeah. So, Jim, I'm going to throw that to you because... Oh, thank you, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just had dinner last night with a... Uh, um, I, I don't know the answer to the question, although last night I had dinner with another Alzheimer's family, and I noticed a little chip inside the glasses of the uh, wife who had Alzheimer's, and I realized that that was a chip that let her find her glasses. and. Uh, she has a chip on her phone and a chip on her keys. And the I want one. Yes. <laughs> I, I have a chip on my shoulder, but that's a different, different thing. Yeah. yeah. Several of your comments. Have been. <laughs> so he said, uh, you know, look up Orbit on, on on the web, and for each different device, they have a a track uh, a tracking mechanism that you can put inside your glasses on the back of a card on the back of your phone and a little 
vehicle that you can put on your keychain that allows you with one um, application on the care partner's phone, then that you can define those different items. And you don't have to, the problem with calling Jerry's phone is that when she's lost it, she always just happens to have the ringer turned off. So it's hard to find, and that's a vital, a vital tool for. I mean, having a smartphone, if you know, we really, when we go out and make our Alzheimer's presentation, which we do very frequently, we always encourage people who don't have dementia, who are our age, who don't have a smartphone, to learn to use that technology before they have dementia. Because once you become impacted, it's so much harder to learn, and it's such a vital tool for Jerry today. She uses it in so many ways to maintain her independence, which we were talking about earlier. And so this helps her find her vital tool. Yeah, I think these t technologies that are trying to uh, let people be independent longer, because again, quite frankly, there are many people who don't have a loved one by their side, who right. live alone, who are suffering with dementia and trying to find their way. But these technologies are there, one of the challenges is they have to learn to be adaptive with us into the disease. And we've actually done some studies on technologies and surveys. So these are the things that we talk about together with you, or you would do it on a Facebook community. Let's get it out in the open. <laughs> Let's not keep it uh, closed in where we in fact can flip it and make it valuable as statements. Uh, not everything will hit, but we'll certainly, we'll be in the zone of the lived experience. So. It will be easier in 20 years when the generation will have been much more familiar with technology. As our generation, our generation as right? our generation yeah. has <laughs> dementia, we did not grow up with the technology that has so transformed life today. But, and so we've got to go through this transitional period that's more difficult for us. Now, wait a minute. I want to take issue with what you just said. <laughs> I choose to accept it. I, I don't want to be remembered that way by my son or my grandchildren. Uh, I don't want to be remembered that way. And that's why I fight. I fight for yes, them. Absolutely. And that's why I'm fearless. I, you are fearless. I used to be appropriate, but that was really dumb. <laughs> but I... It, it's unacceptable for our future or for the next generation. I fight for the next generation of women for better options for care. Uh, so I, I... Thank you, Meryl. <laughs> we completely say thank agree. You. But yes. the people we speak to often I know. are not fearless like you. Or they're not fierce together with us. Mm -hmm. and, and we're trying to convince them to, to make to cross that void, and it's very challenging. See that undercurrent in the a <laughs> So, Nick, you wrote to us from Virginia. Where do you see the A-list in five years? Oh. You know, wow. the A-list the a started as an idea, all right? Unless people own it with you, mm -hmm. work it, use mm -hmm. it, we could be a big formal study, which is what the FDA expects, and which what is being done, quite frankly, under A.D. Pace, mm -hmm. And Holly, you may want to address that. But this has energy right. and a fast turn, and you can use that information in your conversations online together, but you're sharing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important energy that we have, so we can step up and raise our hand if there's a trial or say, no, that's not what, how we see this mm -hmm. at all. And our response times are fast. Do you want to describe a formal study and sure. what it looks like? <laughs> sure. Um, so as part of this overall initiative, there's something called AD Pace, as you mentioned, and there's the What Matters and What Matters Most study. Mm. Um, and that particular study, what we're doing is interviewing individuals um, and uh, with all different types of individuals because each person's lived experience is very different based on where they grew up, who their parents were, what their different backgrounds are, that's very important to get that one-on-one -on -one understanding and interview process to learn what matters and what matters most. Um, after that, you take all of those different answers and you put them into common, in, common information or common um, topics, thank you. Um, and those concepts help us understand that activities of daily living, those things that mm -hmm. you've mentioned earlier, are really important, maybe more so than longer life. And 
we'll start to hear that in that research. And then we'll do a much broader survey where we're able to go out to hundreds and hundreds of people uh, to test and explore what we learned in the first phase. Mm -hmm. And that information will come back with some answers on what matters and what matters most to different individuals with different characteristics. But the vision of the A-list long term, I think, is much broader than that very formal structured study. And one of its only limitations right now is it's in one format, on one, on, on one Facebook um, type of, of community or these types of technologies. And I think over time, these communities will split and feed into other technologies such that the A-list can become much more than just the surveys mm -hmm. um, and the continuous feedback. Because as you're talking about, there's new technologies every 10 years, every two years. Um, and so the answers of what matters and what matters most will likely change. So how we, we um, ask those questions, we'll always need to continuously ask. We have done some of that in the development of some technologies and mm -hmm. also some online tools that are being used that accelerated the development because they had yeah. input from those living yeah. with the disease. Exactly. We couldn't follow that. Mm -hmm. And with an adaptation, that accelerated their development. So there, there mm -hmm. is potential, I think, yeah. uh, within that. But again, people will see things mm -hmm. that are different. When Jim and Jerry go up on the hill, their story is powerful, impressive. Mm -hmm. But if they pull out some other data that they have mm -hmm. from their A-list mm -hmm. cohort and their members, you know, their team mm -hmm. behind them, their army behind them, yeah. that I think adds yeah, to their story. Mm -hmm. um, so there, yeah. there are two elements yeah. of power here. One is power in numbers, as you rightly say, mm -hmm. and then the other element, and, and the A-list is on the vanguard of this, along with the organization some people out there on Facebook may have heard of called Dementia Alliance International, which is of, mm -hmm. by, and for people living with dementia. Nobody runs that group except people who have yeah. dementia. Self-advocacy. Mm -hmm. That's a power of, let me show you what I can do so that you stop focusing just on what I can't do. Mm -hmm. Let me show you what I am not what you fear I no longer am. Having your own voice is important and valuable. Sharing your voice, mm -hmm. even more valuable. Mm -hmm. Sharing your voice in com combination and coalition with other similar, powerful, but still individual voices, each with your own perspective, each standing as, as a whole person I mean, we all have disabilities. We all have limitations. Uh, Jim and I were joking about the chip on my shoulder. That's only, <laughs> only scratching the surface of my limitations. So why is it in dementia that, that we, we assume or we impose on people an assumption that this one limitation takes away your voice and legitimacy from anything that you might choose to say at any stage of the disease once there's been a diagnosis? That's fundamentally wrong, both as a policy matter and as a moral and ethical issue. And the A-List and Dementia Alliance International and other platforms are just platforms. It's the people and their voices and your views and your wants and your needs being expressed collectively. That's where the power to create change is in. It is going to evolve over those five years and beyond. I think also teasing out the nuances in the dynamic in a couple or a parent and adult uh, child and a parent early on when you make sure that the world is smooth around them for as long as they can because no one wants to take away a loved one's independence uh, but teasing out where those you know edges are or what becomes problematic I think will add to the value because we don't disappear we didn't. St we started out as spouses mm -hmm. <laughs> and children, and we, that's who we are. Mm -hmm. uh, we end up over time being the caregiver or care partner, but that's not the way we started. And there's an ongoing dynamic that nobody has tapped into that says we're there at the beginning. I think, and we just have to sort of sort out those roles and manage it. So I think that that duality is is worth uh, talking about. We have so much to talk about, more time. We hope we've given you a taste of what the A-list is like, uh, five years. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, really be old Jim. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll still be talking. We'll still be talking. Mm -hmm. um, we really thank you. This was our first experiment, really, with an A-list live. If you like this format, <laughs> would you, did you like this format? Would you come back and do it again and answer their questions specifically? Hardcore? <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course. Sure. Definitely. I love talking about it. It's the only way we're going to break down some of the right. break down some of the barriers and open about. it for others. So, of thank you. Mm -hmm. and thank you for what you do. And I would like to say, uh, knowing what we do for our loved ones as women, when men do that, takes my breath away. So, to all the men out there who are, are in fact taking care of a loved one, <laughs> uh, really, uh, you know, bravo. I think women have done it. Uh, for years, but men men did the financials, but much more. And what a wonderful couple! I mean, yes. you are our ambassadors. So, thank you, thank you so much, uh, and thank you for joining us. And uh, let's do it again sometime. Let's let's hear from you. Oh, by the way, you can join the A list. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget it. How could I forget a plug? Right? <laughs> it's A list, the number four research dot org. Come join us, test it. Oh, by the way, we are on a secure platform. We yes. had a lawyer check us out. Martha checked us out. Yes. And I'm in. <laughs> and Just transparent, and you're in. And All right. in. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, and uh, hope to hear from you again. See you soon.